Okay. So we want to begin with our opening prayer. Kathy, would you mind reading that? Sure. Loving God, in the evening of this day, we pause to rest in you. Quiet our minds that they may be still. Fill our hearts that they may abide in love and trust. Amen. 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 And Janelle, would you mind doing the reading? Okay. Sorry, I'm just clicking over. If you can't find it, that's okay. Oh, uh, no, I, I think it's here. I am the vine, that one, right? Yep, that's the one. Okay. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. The chief thing that separates us from God is the thought that we are separated from him. We fail to believe that we are always with God and that he is part of every reality. The present moment, every subject, every object we see, our inmost nature are all rooted in him. But we hesitate to believe this until personal experience gives us the confidence to believe in it. This involves the gradual development of intimacy with God. God constantly speaks to us through each other as well as from within. The interior experience of God's presence activates our capacity to perceive him in everything else, in people, in events, in nature. Okay. We'll get ready for our 30 minutes of silence. You wanna sit comfortably, hopefully with your back straight and feet on the floor to allow for easy breathing. And we'll take a few deep breaths so we become aware of our breathing. And then choose a sacred word as the symbol of your intention to consent to God's presence and action within you. Perhaps a word from the reading or another word that connects you to God. When the bell sounds, please mute yourself and then follow the sound into the silence. And when the bell sounds again to end the silent period, allow yourself to come back slowly to the space. Remain in silence for a bit until we share the Lord's Prayer together. Okay, and we'll begin.
Let's say the Our Father together. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. Hallowed, be hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom thy come. Kingdom come. Thy, will be thy will be done. On earth, on as, earth it is as it in is heaven. in heaven. Give us this, give day, us this day our, our, daily, bread. our daily bread. And forgive us, and forgive our, us trespasses. our trespasses. As, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass, who trespass against, us. against us, and lead us, and not, lead us not into temptation, into temptation but, deliver but deliver us, us from, evil. from evil. For thine is the, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the, power and, the glory, and the glory, forever and, forever and, ever, and, ever, and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, I wasn't sure what we wanted to talk about tonight. So um, first I wanna thank you, Kathy, for mentioning that book to me, The Daily Reader for Contemplative Living. You know, I actually had it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I started looking through my books and I had it. Oh, and okay. um, it's a, that's where the reading came from for tonight. It's excerpts from the works of Father Thomas Keating. And um, it's very, uh, there are a lot of very good uh, readings in there. It's a daily thing. And um, I was intrigued by this one. Um, the idea that we are separated from God only in that we think we are separated. <laughs> and um, the gradual development of intimacy with God. And that God is is united with us in everything, in every object, in our um, inmo innermost na nature, in the present moment. Um, but we hesitate to believe this until personal experience gives us the confidence. Um, and I guess what I wanted to ask is about um, your personal experience that maybe helps you to understand our connection with God in all things? Has there been an experience in your life that kind of opened the door to the idea of intimacy with God? I think I can share something. Okay. So this happened a few years back. Uh, it was a Sunday and um, I had left church and I think because just judging from where I was this is not my usual drive home so I must have stopped at the grocery store or something like that before I went home and um, I was driving and I uh, saw a man on the side of the road um, selling flowers and I'd often seen him there uh, uh, selling flowers. I've never bought the flowers. Um, but I saw him walking to my um, car door, you know, I, I, and I remember thinking, oh no, I don't want to buy any flowers. <laughs> you know, I don't want to buy any flowers. You know, there are all these cars here. Why is he coming up to uh, my um, window? And uh, so he came up to my window and I was like, oh, okay, fine. I have to engage with him. And the first thing I was going to say was, thank you, no thank you. I, I, I don't wanna buy any flowers. And then uh, he just handed me the flowers and said, oh, these are for you. And I, I was totally shocked and I was like, you know, how, how much? Then he goes, no, no, no. Um, you're meant to have these. And he just handed them to me. And I, th I think he said something like, oh, you know, uh, uh, for your beautiful smile, you're, these are just for you, you're, you're meant to have these. And he just walked off. And I completely, I mean, I was grateful to him and I said, thank you, but I totally sensed that that was from God. Like God was, giving me, I, I don't know how else to say it, but I was just so grateful and I really felt like it was a present from God. And I remember going home, taking a picture of it, you know, sending it to my, my, my family and look who 
what I got on my way home from church today. Uh, God sent me flowers. So that, yeah. Oh, that's Just a wonderful story. That person and then also the flowers, but I totally felt like it, it was directly, it was kind of like he sent someone to give me a gift. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really a nice story. Cool. Good thing you were open to receive them. Some people mm -hmm. won't roll down their window. It's true. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Or look the person in the eye. Right. Right. Yeah, um, yeah I, I definitely remember just being very hesitant, like, oh, no, you know, I don't want to buy this. <laughs> <laughs> and there they were meant for you. Yeah. <laughs> Dan or Kathy, did anything come to mind for you? I, I don't think anything is dramatic, but I will say that, um, especially during the pandemic, um, nature has spoken to me in ways that um, are greater and more frequent than ever before. Even tonight, mm. um, we put out um, several bird feeders and a hummingbird feeder. And I've been saying to Bill, do you think the hummingbirds will be coming soon? And, you know, I've never been very successful in getting hummingbirds. And we'll, as soon as um, I looked out the window, there was a hummingbird, a green oh, wow. ruby-throated hummingbird on our feeder. And, and um, so I'm feeling um, more like, uh, more aware of how those um, beings, creatures, plants, flowers are all God's creation. And mm. uh, uh, he's provided them for us to enjoy and to care for. And um, it's been um, not a dramatic thing, but certainly something that if you look for it um, every day, especially on beautiful days like this, but um, every day you can find part of his creation. Um, so that's been meaningful. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> how, um, how awesome nature can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so powerful. I can probably list 25 different moments in my life where I have felt the connection. And um, often it was with music, usually singing as opposed to listening to it. I just find it's very, I don't know, intimate with God at times with singing certain styles or moments have been really special and um i remember on a youth group trip to canyon de Chez, we went to new mexico for a work week from indiana i grew up in indiana so it was a really long trek and during our vacation time of the trip we went to canyon de Chez, which is in i think arizona and um it has beautiful cliff dwelling ruins to visit. So you can't climb up in the ruins where the families and people used to live, but the, um, but the canyon was available to walk in. So you could see the, where the cliff dwellers lived and be near it, but you couldn't climb up all the way up to it. But it was lovely to, to park the car, the bus, and then walk down into the canyon. And then our youth leader told us to hike back in silence. Mm. Extremely powerful for these teenagers who, mm. you know, that was that was before the day of earbuds and everything else you know, <laughs> with life. But it was still very, very powerful for us teenagers to have 30 minutes of silence and hiking and helping each other up the hill. It was really beautiful. Oh, wow. Um, for me, like you said, Jan, there have been many, many times where there's, I felt for whatever this sort of personal connection that God was in some way aware of me and wanting to tell me something or give me something. Um, but there was a time in particular that was kind of dramatic for me um, my son had to have heart surgery as a baby. 
and um, it was very successful. So um, he just had to see the cardiologist every year and just, you know, be checked on for any scar tissue or anything. It wasn't open heart. They were actually able to do it from the side. His aorta was almost completely blocked. So um, they opened it up and, um, if, you know, everything was fine. At least I thought so. And then, um, and he wasn't restricted in his activity. So he was playing soccer and playing baseball in the summer. And at 12, the cardiologist felt that he, um, that something wasn't quite right and sent him to have a stress uh, test done at, in addition to an echocardiogram. And it turned out that when he was on the, the um, treadmill, that his blood pressure was going up very high. And the cardiologist was very concerned about that. So to make a long story short, they decided that they needed to do um, angioplasty, or at least to do the, um, the catheterization, and to see if he needed to have the angioplasty, which is the balloon put in. They were very, they were worried about scar tissue might be causing a closing up again of the, the part of the aorta. So I was just really pretty flipped out about all this because it had been such a, a tremendous, tremendously difficult experience for my husband and me when it happened, when Kevin was, you know, after he had been born. And, you know, I had a lot of emotional scars from that. And this whole idea of it kind of coming back into our lives again, just made me very, very anxious. And I remember a couple nights before the procedure was supposed to happen, um, I was just feeling very upset and almost really kind of angry about having to go through this again. And about Kevin having to go through it now when he was aware of it as he hadn't been as an infant. And I ended up going to church, going into the church when no one else was there, into the worship space and just um, sitting down to pray. And I didn't know what to pray. It was like nothing, I, I, nothing came out. And so I picked up one of the, um, the books that was sitting there on, on, in the pew and started reading. I just flipped to a certain page and whatever, very randomly and started reading. And I really felt that the words were speaking to me. And so then I was able to express myself and I got, you know, express my anger, I, my fear, my, um, uh, just all the emotional stuff came pouring out. And I just felt so much better. I just felt so relieved because I felt God reassuring me after all that was over. Well, uh, two days later, the morning of the procedure, Ray and I took him early to the hospital and we had to, you know, leave him as they were taking him in the elevator to go to the, to the procedure, to the, I guess, the surgical room. And um, I just had this flooding feeling of peace that I've never experienced before or since, um, that everything was just gonna be fine. And there was nothing to be worried about. And so the procedure lasted like a half an hour or so, 45 minutes. I just um, sat and, and, um, and looked out the window and prayed. And I was kind of like singing to myself, like interiorly, I was singing different songs. And it's funny that the music came into play there, but um, I just never felt so peaceful. And poor Ray was really upset. I mean, when, when we had to, the elevator door closed, Ray was really tearing up and he was just upset. And I, you know, I tried to comfort him, but you know, I just felt, I didn't feel that way. I just felt like everything was going to be fine, that it was all in God's hands and that I had nothing to fear. And it was the most amazing experience. Like I said, I've never felt that way again, that, that much peace. Beautiful. It was really, uh, and then it, and it turned out everything was fine. The procedure went well. And, um, he, um, they did the balloon and opened it up. He did have some scar tissue and they said he didn't need a stent, which surprised me. And, um, everything was fine after that. Um, we, he didn't need any other you know, procedure or anything else done. And um, he's, he'll be 36 this month. And um, the only thing that the cardiologist looks for when he goes every couple of years is high blood pressure. They always take a look at that 
because they said sometimes with this kind of surgery, people will have, as adults, will have um, high blood pressure. But um, so far, so good. But it was just an amazing experience, alone in the church, you know, just pouring my heart out. Mm. That's so good. Yeah, it was really. And ever since then, I mean, I sort of felt it before that, but not like that. That was really, really strong. And um, it was kind of like when they people say the peace that God can give that the world cannot give. That's mm-hmm. what I felt like I had experienced was that kind of peace. When I have those moments, I feel like it's the Holy Spirit. Mm. I feel, you know, I don't hear God's voice. I, I feel his presence. Yes. And I think of that as the spirit. Yes. And I guess if people have not had that kind of experience, then it would be harder for them to do something like centering prayer, you know, to be, to feel like that had meaning. Um, because it, it is, you know, it's so, it's so abstract in a way, you know, and yet it isn't, but it's not the, the way other prayer is, and it's not so concrete, it's not, and it's just giving over of yourself and of your own expectations, and just saying, basically, here I am, Lord, and I wish to be in your presence, and just kind of resting in that. If you hadn't had the experience of feeling God's presence previous to that, I don't know if it would be easy to, you know, it would be hard to do, to let go like that and think that something was happening, I guess. Yeah. But I think it also, like any quiet time or meditation helps us get to that point where we're opened up more to receive the message or to feel the peace. I think that it still has extremely important value in our lives yeah and helps helps us focus and helps us make decisions i mean it helps us in so many ways so yeah yeah i think it truly does but your story about how you and ray were not at the same place in your comfort level with the surgery that's such a good example of how that's a typical life struggle that as we go through these crises in our lives or these difficult times, it's, we, we each have our way of getting comfort through it. And we're not always on the same page with our close relatives. And you have to really work to find that connection and keep connected through it. It's so yeah. Some kind of a bridge. Between yeah. Two. Yeah. You can see why families, don't make it through hardship sometimes because they never do open up to each other in that way right right so it's nice you guys do yeah it was really truly a blessing yeah it really was and ray was okay you know it was just that was a particularly difficult moment for him i think that he had um been sort of like um pushing away the idea that it was coming, you know, like he, he didn't want to think about it. And yeah. so I had been upset about it for, you know, a co- as soon as I heard that we were going to do the procedure. And so I had been like wrestling with it for a while. And I think he had been pushing it off. And then when that moment happened where we were separated from Kevin and he was going up the elevator or down the elevator, whatever the case was, yeah. um, he really felt that separation. And I think that sense of helplessness that there was no control, you know, totally that everything was out of control. My brother-in-law was that way when my sister had to go in for an emergency C-section and he was not open to hearing any consolation at all. You know, all of our attempts to say, it's really going to be okay. You just have to believe it's going to be okay. It's out of your hands here. And he was like, how can you say it's going to be okay? How do you know and this, it was so hard. It was like, yeah. <laughs> and it was okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I wonder sometimes, you know, um, if we had lost him, which we came so close to doing when he was an infant, um, how do you, how would we have done together? 
in terms of being able to heal and keep our relationship together. I've heard many couples say that they, with that kind of grief, that it's just too hard to make it work. Yeah. So we were, um, we were tremendously blessed. Tremendously yeah. blessed. One of the um, priests that we interviewed for Father Manny's position it, as a committee um, runs a support group with her husband of uh, suicide because their um, son at age 24 committed suicide. Mm. And, um, and they really struggled with getting through it. And it was before she beca had become a priest too. So they were both working parents and dealing with the loss of their son. And they, they attended a support group where the other members were still wallowing in their misery to the point where they, they weren't hearing any comfort from anyone. They weren't open to receiving any comfort. And mm. they left that meeting and looked at each other and said, is that going to be us? You know, in 10 years, one woman had been there nine years, I think. Is wow. that going to be us? And they just made a decision that, no, that is not going to be us. We are going to find joy in the world again. We're going to find a way through this. And they just started talking about it and finding people that help them better. And uh, and now they lead their own support groups. So hmm, pretty, interesting. Pretty amazing. Very amazing. Well, I guess we're getting close to time. So um, why don't we do our closing prayer? I'd be happy to read that for us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you very much. Thanks for leaving. Good to out. see you all. Yes. Yes, Janelle. Have a good week, everyone. Thank good you. night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. See you Thursday, Kathy. Okay. Oh, the other Kathy. The other Kathy and I <laughs> sing together on Thursday. Yeah. I that I just realized that. <laughs> you can join us too, Kathy. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs>